This is an after school program podcast. Welcome to the Home Studio Hangout podcast, where we explore what it's like building, running, and working out of a home studio with your hosts, Joshua Matatek, Andrew Simmons, and many guests in different areas of the music industry. Welcome to episode 15 of the Home Studio Hangout podcast. We are super stoked to have you today with our guests, but before we get to that, I just wanted to take a quick second and say thank you so much to everybody who listens. We recently crossed 500 downloads, and that is not including the people that listen and watch us on YouTube. This is just podcasts, Apple, Spotify downloads. So, We are super grateful for everybody who listens. Thank you so much for giving us your time and attention. And we hope you're growing with us a little bit, you know, learning a few things. And if you are, let us know. Find us on Instagram at Home Studio Hangout or find me at Music by Drew or find Josh at Josh Writes Songs. We love to talk to you. If you have any questions or something we mentioned in the podcast you'd like us to elaborate on, we'd love to like have a conversation with you. For today's episode, we have our guest, Nicholas DeLorenzo, who's an amazing mixing and mastering engineer from Melbourne, Australia. He works under Panorama Mastering. We go through his come up into working for a mastering engineer to making his own business, being an international mixing and mastering engineer, working with a bunch of different clients. We talk about setups. We talk about different little tricks and tips and things like that. It's a chock full episode. And real quick, before we get into it, there is a little bit of language throughout this episode. Just wanted to give you a forewarning if there are kids or if that's not something that you really want to listen to. um, Feel free to not listen to this episode or save it for a time when you are able to listen to it without little uh, sensitive ears around. But thank you very much. And let's get on to the episode. Welcome back to the podcast. My name is Joshua. This is Andrew. And today we have a very special guest, Nicholas DiLorenzo. Did I say your name right? Yeah, you did. Wonderful. And he is hailing from Australia. And uh, we had met up earlier uh, in 2020 at NAM, And he's just a genuine guy all around. Knows a ton about mixing and mastering. And we are very excited to have him here today. So welcome to the show. Nick. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, man. Thanks for having me on, guys. I was I was so excited because um, Josh is a real bubbly personality. And then I saw he's doing a podcast and I'm like, wow, I really enjoyed spending, you know, a brief amount of time with you while I was in LA. And I'm like, let's, let's continue that conversation. Whatever fun happens and whatever ensues or nuggets come out or gets discovered, you know, let it be, let it be a byproduct that comes up on the podcast. That's exactly kind of like how we, how we want this to come across anyway. Like we want it to feel really like, you know, conversational, natural, whatever, you know, just kind of like everybody's getting to know each other. Everybody's just chilling, talking about audio and work and gear or whatever comes up, you know? I feel like yeah. that's like the Excited. best way for it to happen. So, uh, you said you're in uh, you said you're in Melbourne, right? Yeah, I'm in Melbourne. Cool, cool. You cool. been here? I have not been out there. It is. Uh, I think it's goal for me and Josh both to get out to get out that way whenever our stuff opens back up. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Definitely. You're you're not you're not like one of those people who like want to visit Australia, but you're like an arachnophobic or or something. You nah. you, you don't. No. Nah. Okay. Good. Because I've, I've got a few friends like that over on the other side of the of the you know in America and throughout Europe, and I'm like, guys, just because you watched a video on YouTube <laughs> saying we have deadly creatures doesn't mean you're going to walk into it every two seconds. It's, yeah. it's completely fine. <laughs> Although I've been bitten by a spider the other night while I was sleeping. <laughs> that, doesn't, that doesn't count. <laughs> <laughs> that was that's just purely coincidental 
No, man, I'm from I'm from the south, southeast of America, so like southern south. So it's like outdoors all day, every day, man. That's like yeah. where uh, I grew up. I've nice. seen like two oh, snakes in my lifetime, and like that's it. That was enough for me. Like, <laughs> yeah, what, what, I'm, I'm good. I, I missed you there, Josh. What did you say you'd seen? I, I said I've seen like two snakes in my lifetime living up north, and that's that's it. I'm, I tapped <laughs> out. I have no interest in snakes or anything. The bugs in Florida felt more like animals than insects, but you know, so. <laughs> oh man, yeah, no, fair enough. I think, I think what's really cool is that I live about fifteen twenty minutes out of the city, and in the morning, in the really early hours of the morning, there'll be kangaroos at the park. <laughs> That's kangaroos wild. Are which is sick, terrifying. I, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just north of the Melbourne airport, and um, it's pretty open out there so you know yeah it, it isn't uncommon to see a kangaroo on the side of the road or in the morning just go through the park and you'll see a bunch of them um depending on the time of the year which which i think is really special because i've usually lived closer into the city never really experienced that but um yeah man it's it's cool out here you guys definitely should come definitely should come and enjoy it i heard the uh i hear the the coffee game in australia is uh it's pretty nice Oh yeah, I um, I got really depressed when I was in the states, like <laughs> morbidly depressed. I I actually bought my own coffee maker and stuff when I in, in my luggage because I'm like I'm not gonna I'm not gonna survive over there and and I didn't because <laughs> every, every morning I'd make my own coffee, I'd have extra, I'd bring it down to the lobby so the staff could have some. They loved it because they mm-hmm. actually got like I I, I honestly compared. And no offense, but like when I was having petrol there, like uh, I thought it was petrol basically. It, it tasted <laughs> that horrible. <laughs> I, was, I was like, "What is this? Who puts this in their body?" Um, but yeah, no coffee game's good here. You guys would enjoy it. Yeah. It's so in my area, especially like it's really hard to find good coffee shops. So whenever I have time, I will literally drive uh, almost forty-five minutes round trip just to get a cup of coffee from my favorite coffee shop because like. It's just so hard to find good coffee uh, around this area. Not not in my area. Yeah, <laughs> you a... have coffee shops for days over there. LA yeah. can be a bit tough because there's a lot of chains. Yeah, like I like I, I like going to like the coffee bean and tea leaf or whatever it's called. But it's yeah. like you're basically getting coffee with a ton of sugar. But like you know, I, I considered it vacation. I was letting myself go. <laughs> You know, no, nah, dude, I so, can't do that. I can't do that. I got, I have like a regimented like pour over setup or my AeroPress. Like I'm too, I'm too used to the good stuff to like get gotta, anything overly sugary or anything. I like got to get back on it, man. I got to get back oh, on man. it. But uh, sugar, sugar kills yeah. me. I think it actually yeah. tastes like really bad with mm-hmm. sugar. Not even that it's sweet. It's just like, what's going on here? It's, mm-hmm. it's crazy. Now, the other day I did make something that was really cool. Uh, is have you had a uh, Cubano? Have you ever made one of those no. before? So it's um, you make it similarly to how you would make, like if you have an espresso machine or if you go to a shop that has one, you could get it made. It's essentially a cappuccino, but you get it made with a little bit of salt, a little bit of raw sugar in the bottom, and then you make it like a cappuccino. And you pour a little, uh, drizzle a little bit of salt on top. And it's got a really cool, like, very Central American kind of like flavor. And it does, it brings out some stuff in like the espresso bean that's really, really cool. That's interesting. Um, we we had, have had some crazy coffee fads here in Melbourne. One of them was putting butter in your coffee. Oh, yeah, we do that. It's called Bulletproof I, I, Coffee. That. Yeah, and I've then heard another of that. one was LSD. Not LSD, the drug, but it was like um, a latte something dandelion. It was like this mixture people would put into their coffee. And I was like, people people would be like, oh, I'm having LSD. And I'm like, what the fuck? Like, bro, <laughs> calm, calm it down. Um, no, 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 no. It's this bag. And they'd, bring, they'd pull out this bag of this like herbal tea leaf shit they'd put in their coffee. I'm like, God, you, you are really cooked. Um, <laughs> but we uh, so that's there was such one a disappointing here. story. I was about to book a flight to Australia. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go now. You see, this is like an ad for like um, Australian tourism. Yeah, exactly. I, I get like government grants and funding for this. Yeah, podcast. I need to. I need to send an email to the Australian Board of Tourism like immediately. <laughs> oh. 
It's it's by dropping dandelion roots into an espresso machine with soya milk. Interesting. So they're, so they're it. so they're pushing they're pressing the dandelions like espresso beans. Like, That's interesting. Let, let me just let me just get Baristas prepare the LSD by dropping ground dandelion roots into an espresso machine and frothing up soya milk the same way made as a regular latte. So that's a latte, soya, and dandelion, LSD. Oh, okay. So it's a, like a dandelion pulled like espresso, but it's a soy latte. That's so weird. People do that with uh, people do that here with mushrooms. Like mu- mushroom, edible mushroom or mushroom... Crazy mushroom. No, no, no. Edible mushrooms. Yeah, oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Have you ever heard of that, Josh? <laughs> no. Yeah, you I live in that? a place where the term barista didn't exist until <laughs> 2005. Okay? <laughs> like, all they serve here is mud water. Like, people think that Sheets Coffee is gold, and it's literally just mud water. But I'll drink it anyway, because I don't have a soul. But, like, <laughs> mushrooms? Yeah, dude. Why? It's, you ground it up and you pull it. You pull the water through it like espresso. Like you know, how espresso is ground really fine and yeah. compact. Yeah, same way. And it's probably the same for the dandelions. Like the way that they do that. That's pretty interesting. I'm gonna have to. Like, I'm gonna have to check that out. <laughs> how do people? How do get people come to that? Like, does does like the cafe run out of like, or just like somebody gets a delivery and they've added extra stuff into the delivery? Like they picked it up and they put it in there. I don't. I don't get it. Yeah, I, well, I always it's, think it's about crazy. like I always think about weird stuff like how do people uh like just coffee in or in general like who who saw this bean and was like you know if I roast if I cook this a certain way and then grind it up and then pull water through it like it's just gonna taste great. <laughs> oh, I should know the answer to that. There, there's a there's a YouTuber. I'll get his name quickly um and he wrote a really comprehensive book on coffee and growing regions and the history of it and the way it's dried out and i actually got Mm -hmm. the book and read it top to bottom um james hoffman is the youtuber and he's insanely knowledgeable he's a barista world champion Mm -hmm. he lives over in britain and he's super neurotic about coffee um yeah but yeah, I, I, I can imagine you'd find the answer somewhere lying with something he's published um, in the past if you really wanted to find out. Because it's actually oh. a cherry, not a bean. It's, it's, yeah, a, it's, yeah. it's a coffee cherry and then it's... And a, yeah. So... Yeah, man, no, crazy. yeah, they, actually, they call it a bean. Let, yeah. Let's, yeah. Let, let, let's flip it, flip, flip it onto audio stuff. Yeah, um, for sure. I'm supposed yeah. to say the same thing. Let, I am let, still like, thinking I, I, about mushrooms. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna say, what was did did you guys ever have to do coffee runs, uh, earning your bones at the start? Always. I, there's nothing here. There's no coffee here, and there's no audio here, so I never had to do that. <laughs> Josh is the audio there. <laughs> uh, well, okay. Well, no, I can't say that. ID yeah. Labs is here, okay, and they made Mac Miller. So shout out to them. That's true. Where, where are you based again, Josh? At the moment, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Oh, okay. I know a few people around your your neck of the woods. That's um, oh, yeah. That's really that's really cool. I, I don't know why. I thought you were in. I think it's Burbank in in LA, or I just I just mm. thought you're in that side of town for some reason. I, oh. I don't know why. Yeah, yeah. No, I, no. I I do not live on the warm West Coast. <laughs> he wishes. No, no. I wish. You're like getting twelve inches of snow at the moment, and yeah, nah, everything is ice right snow. now. So stuff that, no, nah, not my, not my thing, man, not my thing. But anyway, guys, what what are you guys yeah. been working on? What what's what's happening in your audio worlds? So uh, for me, so I'm actually about to have a kid. Uh, so we're with child. We're like, uh, yeah, it's big time. So uh, we're I'm working on um, finishing up everything I possibly can to try and. Uh, at least like all of my like existing projects so that I can start new projects like and essentially take a month off. <gasps> that's incredible. Congratulations, Thank man. You, man. That's, Thank you. That's super. Yeah. You, you, you're glowing and you're glowing in the cast. <laughs> like I can see that. That's really smart. I, I, I can tell you, I did not do that when I had my first son and it was hell trying to go between the studio home and the hospital 
Mm-hmm. Um, good man, good man yeah. for taking time off. That, yeah, that's yeah. super cool. I I uh, I know that if I didn't, I would be in big trouble. So. <laughs> Uh, and I, I don't, I, I have the ability to, so, and it's kind of working out to where like I'm finishing up all of the projects roughly around the same time that he's supposed to be here. Uh, I think we have like three, three or four weeks left until he's like due or whatever. Um, so yeah, finishing up a couple things and then I'm like, anybody who's trying to start a project, I'm like saying, Hey. Let's start in like mid-April instead of in March. <laughs> and there, most of them are like, cool, and will still give me deposits for everything. So like, that's still good too. So I'm able to like set aside the money to like make sure that I have the month taken care of. That's, um, that's really cool. That's probably the best response I've gotten to when I've asked people what they're doing in the studio. It's <laughs> like, you know, like, because people could be working on like the biggest record or with the biggest producer, but having a kid is like... It, not, nothing's going to replace us. That's awesome. That's really cool. Yeah, man. Um, what about you, Josh? Uh, right now, I just... Um, so we moved back to Pittsburgh uh, early September. And uh, we've been trying to figure out what we're doing. And we kind of decided that, um, you know, my girlfriend wants to work with the NHL. And uh, she was working with Minor League Baseball at the headquarters in St. Petersburg. Um, and so... We kind of just came to this point where it's like, well, we're going to see where things are. And if by summer, you know, things aren't working out, we're not going to struggle to live in Pittsburgh because it's very expensive to live in this area. And uh, we're just going to go ahead and move to Nashville. So that's been like our big like motivator right now is just, you know, grinding things out and, um, you know, going from there. Been working with uh, a few really cool like pop artists and doing some still doing a bunch of like metal sound design projects. That's always a blast. And I've been fascinated by uh hyper pop lately. So that's been my big, my big <laughs> thing right now. That's exciting, man. That's like, like Nashville is, is, is a completely different world to like most other cities over in the States. What's is funny like- is whenever we like, okay. So like if this all works out and we move there, that will be like the first real time that we've ever been to Nashville. Like we've never been there. We're just getting opinions on places where we're not going to get shot at. And then we're going <laughs> to, we're going to move there. That's awesome. It's like, that's oh, where man. there's so many pop writers there and a bunch of publishers are really mm-hmm. working out of there heavily right now. And it's like, at the end of the day, my goal is to write songs for a living. So it would make sense if we made the move. That's awesome. Mate. You guys are living it up. Super exciting, man. That's we're, cool. We're trying, I love it. man. Like I got, you know, like baby, baby number one, or is it baby number one for you, Andrew? Mm-hmm. Yeah, number one. Yeah, baby number one and Nashville baby for Josh. That's um, <laughs> that, that's super cool. That's like, yeah, what man. have you been up to? Me, mate. I've just been cruising. Like I, I don't, I don't have the super exciting, you know living life in the fast lane like you two do at the moment. Um, I'm just cruising because I, 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 I've got my routine. I've got a shit ton of jobs coming in. So I'm just m- pinging through records, mastering them, um, keeping things going on in the background in terms of for the studio and building it up. And I don't know, I'm just like, I, I, I really, I really hustled hard in 2020. And I think you saw that a lot, Josh, um, after I got back from the States and, now I'm sort of in a position where I just want to cruise through this year until I can get back on a plane and go traveling throughout America and Europe and keep, you know, building up my, my business. So yeah, it's a cruising period for me, man. That's, that's okay, awesome. That's what it is. So do you primarily just do mastering right now? I mean, your business is called Panorama Mastering, but do you also mix? Yeah, I, I do mix like probably 85% of the work is mastering and then a small percentage is mixing. Um, and the mixing side sort of just came about because, you know, one person was like, Hey, can you mix my record? I'm like, okay, cool. Let's, let's work through it. I mixed it. And then people heard and then other people wanted me to mix and I didn't push it and it just sort of grew into its own thing. And now I'm doing about like 60 to 70 mixing projects a year by accident. That's Um, awesome, man. And it's cool, but mastering is like where I'm really pushing because, Mm -hmm. It's not not pushing as in, in in a forceful way, but like I'm just pushing myself to to develop and and go bigger and better because I know I just I, I really connect with that gap in the market 
mm-hmm. well and I, I really have a passion for for just engaging with music in that in that way rather than getting you know 60 stems in and micromanaging every little you know member of the project's request and it, i don't know i just resonate with the whole process of mastering better so yeah a lot more mastering. And, and it's something that's often like overlooked you know i feel like like if you're a younger artist you never like really put a thought behind like who's gonna master it even mm-hmm. though it's a super super important part and uh you know, so it's cool, like seeing you posting, um, you know, a little bit about your world. I saw about how you um, organize your files and send different, you know, formats to your clients. And, uh, you know, it seems like that there's a lot of, um, you know, uh, like admin work behind mastering and keeping everything straight. Do you have like, um, like, obviously, we all develop our processes as we're going through, but like, did you start out like knowing that if I'm taking on this crazy amount of work, then I need to have it organized a certain way? Or like, was there a point where you weren't doing any of that and you were like, I think I need to do this desperately? <laughs> yeah, I, I think that like I've always been an organized person and it just evolved with my workload. So like, let's just say like the first few years when I was freelancing, I had all my sessions in years. So all my folders would be put in an archive by the year. Then it went down to months. Then months didn't even work because, you know, I'd have so many in each month. I'd forget which month I had to access in order to pull from an archive. So now I just have a numeric system, um, which is generated like whatever the invoice number is, that number follows everything around. So now now I've got systems which allow me to manage, um, last year was about 600 projects. So... You know, that's, that's it, it, man, managing, ma- managing it is really important. I learned how to use the Mac Automator app. Mm-hmm. So I could, oh, yeah. you know, quickly click one button. My whole folder and file structure would be laid out. Um, the batch exporter in Rx is really important for me. So, so this way, you know, all the menial sort of tasks and renaming and folder structure and syncing through Dropbox is just done in the background. Otherwise... You know, it adds so much time and potential human error to what I'm doing. Um, yeah, that's just sort of the evolution. That's the awesome. freaking uh, Mac Automator, man, I think is like something that's so I haven't delved into it because I do. I end up doing a lot of mixing and stuff for people that I produce for. But I feel like there's some things that I could probably learn to use that for in a mixing standpoint as far as like organizational things or auto bouncing stuff for auto organization or having things drop into specific places um and i also feel like that's a a part of the the mac system that's kind of slept on like a lot people don't really talk about it that much yeah i'm no i'm no geek at it by any means. You, the only way I understand it is I Google in YouTube, whatever I'm trying to do, <laughs> and then follow the step, step by step. And then I'm like, cool, done it. Got and, it. I, and I feel like I'm some <laughs> sort of programming wizard. Um, but because it's, it's like, it's well above my prey grade to understand yeah. how that sort of stuff works. Like, you know, you know, just enough yeah. to get be dangerous and get the job done, but that's about it. <laughs> that's exactly how exactly. it was whenever I was redoing my website. Anytime I had to edit the CSS, I would just Google it and then copy and paste the code and pray that it worked. And every time it worked, I was like, yeah, you know, I had graduated from coding school. You know, <laughs> this is my, this yeah. is my side job now. You know, I'm ready to go. I'm going to, I'm accomplished. I'm hacking into the mainframe. Practically frame. Steve Jobs. <laughs> yeah. Practically Steve Jobs. <laughs> yeah like i'm, I'm uh, ready for the next apple event i'll be there presenting uh nick why, why don't you because like i don't know you super well give me like how did you kind of get into production stuff like in general like how like what was your trajectory from like getting started in music to like uh like were you in a band or did you like fall in love with the production side and mastering side of stuff like kind of early on so so in high school, I was in a band and the whole idea was like, how do we get our stuff on MySpace? So you buy, you know, a 10 track Yamaha recorder and I didn't have any microphones. So I was using SingStar microphones, yeah, um, USBing in. And then eventually I found, you know, other ones that, that plugged in. They were just all horrible microphones, but the whole idea was just capturing it. And then I'm like, okay, this is cool. 
and that sort of ran in parallel with what I was doing in music, and then eventually, I know I wanted to record stuff, and I was shit at that, so I was like, what am I going to do? I'll do anything, I'll be at a publisher, I'll be, I'll do anything, I um, mean, I accidentally, I, I love saying the word, uh, saying this, because it was literally me, when I was in uni, just spamming like 40 different places, going, hey, I want to do an internship, hey, I want to do an internship, blah, 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 and like, being ridiculously hungry and getting on the phone and then I ended up at a mastering studio and eventually an assistant there and then that just lapped work into my freelance career and then I just built from there that's so, awesome so, yeah so it happy. really was just like kind of by accident that you got into this and then you realized I like this like this is a good fit yeah. for me yeah M- mastering definitely it's just so it's so chill I recording no Recording, no. Personalities, <laughs> having to make sure a vocal booth always has a bottle of scotch in it. Yeah. Working until 11.30, 1.30 in the morning. <laughs> not me. No way. Uh, that's not for me because I'm very, like, pragmatic. Do things step by step, get it, get to the end. Yeah. Um, working in a recording situation, for anybody who's in a band would understand this, nothing goes to plan yeah <laughs> doesn't matter how well organized you are you go into that studio you want to track guitars first guess what you're going to be laying down bass and drums or the guitarist is going to come late or the strings are going to snap or the vocalist is going to get an idea and it's, it's like I, I i i'm not the personality suited for that i would yeah. have went postal at a, at a recording studio if See, i spent that, that much time in that's it. that's something i struggle with because i love vocal production and i haven't been in a place where i really do a lot because there aren't a lot of people local to me and then COVID happened. So, um, you know, it's a, it's been a bit tough, but you know, I'm pretty pumped cause I have a few artists, uh, coming down to track some vocals and I love the whole process of cutting and producing a vocal, but that's all I'm doing from now on. Like I, I'm not <laughs> like, if I'm working with a band, they need to go to a different engineer because it's, uh, it's a lot, you know? <laughs> Like it's a lot. Yeah. And um I, I totally understand that completely, man. But it definitely uh like all the different personalities can be hard in itself. And then by the end of the day it almost feels like you just ran a five K with your brain because you just had to, you know, r- like think about so many simple things Mm -hmm. way more in depth than you typically need to like every word that you say can like change the direction of a session so it's very Mm -hmm. mentally exhausting oh yeah you're the uh you're the what do they call it you're the uh, as the producer you're kind of the shrink you're the therapist to the singers yeah and and some people are really good at that like Mm -hmm. i take my hats off to people who are good at that. And there's a certain personality that's able to keep a level head and stay mature in their decision-making throughout a process where you've got, you know, band members going in three different directions and going through demo wireless at the same time. They're trying to ride something and the drummer wants to use a different snare drum and it's ringing and sounding like shit. And you're like, no. (laughs) (laughs) Oh my gosh. I, I I probably shouldn't tell this story, but I'm going to tell it anyway. A perfect example of that is I was working with this band who hired me to write and produce for them. So the idea was, is I was going to write the track and then they would track vocals and then like with me and then I would mix and master it. And um, so we had this idea like halfway through the project. Why don't we bring in the other band members? Because whenever I originally got hired for it, it was just a vocalist and nobody else. But now he has a full band. And so I thought that everybody was on the same page that they were going to come in and we were going to kind of like co-write the song together. And so the guitarist was all about this. And uh, the drummer, on the other hand, kept like flipping out that I was writing. He was like, this this isn't authentic. He was like, Slipknot never did that. (laughs) And so I'm like dancing around this. Finally, I'm like, okay, yeah, like you guys can do your thing. I'm going to go grab a bite to eat. I'll be back, whatever. And then they made no progress and they were like, okay, yeah, you should probably just hop in here and finish this song. So I did. It was a really cool song. And so like finally I get through that without like having a meltdown or quitting. And um, (laughs) I'm tracking this vocalist and we're like halfway through the track and he, he just stops in between takes. And I'm like, all right, man, you ready to do it again? And he looks at me dead serious and he goes, do you want to check out the sick tattoo I just got on my back? 
and he took his shirt off and made me look at his tattoo. <laughs> and I didn't know how to react. Like I like part of me wanted to like hype him up, you know, keep the vibe going. And then the other part of me was like, I just like passively aggressively had to fight with your bandmates for two hours. So can you please just put your shirt back on and sing the part? <laughs> And that was the moment that I realized maybe I'm not cut out for this. <laughs> Especially That's like incredible. heavy music. Yeah. <laughs> the pop artists I work with are a blast. It's so much fun. But like. Yeah. <laughs> wow. That's, that's so good. Dude. And I will never. I, I've told that story a few times. And every time someone's like, like somebody really did that. Like imagine he's like sitting there screaming away. And then he just stops. He goes, dude, you want to check out the tattoo on my back? And he just pulls his shirt off. And I'm like. Can you please put your shirt back on, sir? <laughs> <laughs> sir, time and place. Time and place. It's not it. <laughs> oh, my gosh. That's so funny. Yeah. Uh, Nick, what? Uh, so you said you said you met Josh at Nam last year, right? So and you said you uh, you had a good. You had a good grind on 2020. Talk, talk me through like what you did in 2020. Like talk me through your 2020 upgrade level up grind. Yeah, no worries, mate. I, I, I'm just, my brain's catching up on the last one. No, I that's didn't... fine. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. I, I'll collect thoughts on your question, <laughs> no, but for the meantime, fine. I just got to let everything percolate no, that's from fine. the last story. <laughs> that's to fine. be fair, the tattoo was pretty just... sick. He, what, like, like whenever he whenever he was like check booth, out yeah? this sick tattoo like he meant it and then i checked it out and i was like yeah that's a, that's a sick tack tattoo put and your shirt on like, um, <laughs> wow um that's, that's marvelous that's all so right. good <laughs> right. I, I think i think i've absorbed all the energy from that story which i needed there we go i, I, I can keep moving on <laughs> um so 2020 so Basically, before I went over to the States, I was in a position where um, my clientele base was growing rapidly um, throughout Canada, America, UK, Europe. Um, and I'm like, this is a really good thing and I need to make good on this opportunity. And I'm like, in 2019, I saw a whole bunch of my clients posting they were at NAMM from all over the shop, from all over America, from Canada, mm -hmm. from, from everywhere. They're all in the one place. And I'm like, wow, I can see or visit so many of my clients in one spot without having to travel to six different locations in the world. Mm -hmm. So that's why I did it. I had 40 meetings during my two weeks there, which is, which was crazy. That's... I was like running like a madman. Um, oh, all over, and LA, the traffic is shit. So it, yeah. it really was pretty tiring. But um, so, so that was the premise of me going there. It's like, I can see all my clients build up a rapport with them. All the people I know build up a rapport with them um, because I need to expand and, and that's a healthy thing. Um, by the end of 2020, I was about 60% of my business was overseas. Um, so it really, really helped increase that. So basically, built a rapport with all these people. My goal was to figure out who these people were a little bit better than just a project and an email. Mm -hmm. um, and throughout 2020, I, I've got, I had an actual Excel spreadsheet. Even your name is on it, Josh. <laughs> and it's just notes about the conversations we had and where, how, and if I had any opportunity to help them. Um, and that's what I just spent 2020 executing on, you know? And the, my opportunity to, to execute on it for you, Josh, was when you started this podcast. I was like, wow, that's, really cool i want to get on it yeah want to have a chat contribute to it and it's just small contributions like that which kept building a rapport kept building relationships and that just flooded in more work and grew on kept growing in on of itself so it's funny that you said that because like you know i'm still relatively new at this whole thing and 2020 was the first year that it really smacked me in the face that you aren't going to grow your business by giving people a sales pitch. You're going to grow your business by giving as much as you possibly can. And I think that you're probably the most obvious example of that because you, um, I mean, it, it, we talked to John McLucas recently and he was talking about how his goal whenever he's on Facebook is to just give the most that he can in the shortest amount of time. So like 
he would always go out of his way to give an over the top response to somebody's question and make everybody else look like they didn't care. And you do the exact same thing. Um, whether it's how you greet somebody in the conversation or, you know, uh, you know, the really depth that you go to provide feedback and give insight is really, um, you know, next level. And, uh, I think you do a great job at really showing how much you care about this and you care about your community. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. I think, I think there's something to be get, uh, something to be taken from that. Like, and, and I actually just got off a phone call with, um, somebody who got a, a really, really big radio announcer, hit the, hit them up on the Instagram DMs cause they loved the, a record they put out. And I'm like, and they called me and they go, Nick, what do I do? And I go, dude, just be humble, be thankful, be grateful because so many people would react to this and try and milk it and try and get shit out of it. So just, you know, give him a thank you, ask him how you can help him, if there's anything you can do for them and leave it at that. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, that's similar. Like, you know, I think we, we all should in the grand scheme of things, especially if, if you've ever made a hundred dollars in a week off your music, you know, like it could have been a gig, could have mm -hmm. been a, a, a something you recorded, a little side job. Even if you make a hundred bucks in a week, there, there there should be a huge amount of gratitude you have towards the fact that something you're passionate about, or something if you are passionate about it, that is. But um, that that's something you're really passionate about. That's creative. That you're able to, you know, move the needle forward in supporting yourself from it. And um, that's just, you know, that that sort of gratitude has to permeate through everything you do. It shouldn't just be on Facebook. It also should be to the clients who you absolutely love and the clients who maybe cause you trouble and take their shirt off in a vocal booth. Um, <laughs> I just, I just think, you know, that that, that that's um, it, it's a sense of gratitude that that we need to extend to one another because um. You know, we've all experienced it where, where the music industry can get a bit tough, um, either mentally, emotionally, the personalities we deal with, um, sometimes we might not gel with everybody and it can become a bit f friction. Um, that's not really a way to say that properly, but, you know, friction can arise. It can become yeah, a bit yeah. edgy. Um, but yeah, I, I just think, you know, we, we, have to, we have to have a great sense of gratitude, the fact that we live in a world where we can wake up, open up our computer, start working on music and create a living out of it as opposed to maybe 300, 400 years ago would probably be harvesting crop at the bottom of a village in front of a kingdom, you know, living in poverty, which was like the huge majority of the world. Or even now there's still like places where, you know, people are horribly impoverished and, 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 you know, we, we are very, very fortunate. The fact that we can open up a computer, create music right. and call that a lifestyle. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, yeah. I mean, I so think that, about that constantly. The fact that, you know, 40 years ago, all of us more than likely would be out of business. Like, because we aren't able to just get a computer and an audio interface and like, you can write a song that way, you know? And um, that's something that, you know, I'm super grateful for because that's been, that's been my life. You know, I'm kind of on that second generation of producers where it's like, I never knew anything different. Like going to his studio was like special for me because, you know, it's like, wow, like it's the real thing instead of just being <laughs> stuck with my little, you know, focus right interface or whatever I had at the time. And uh, yeah, like, I mean, whether, whether it's, you know, simply being able to log into your computer and pull up a session or, you know, for the clients that pull their shirt off in a vocal session, like, I think that that's a really great standpoint is just to be thankful for everything because it's true. You know, we're pretty, uh, we're pretty fortunate to be in a period of time right now where all this is even possible. Hmm. Spot on. No, that's a good point. Sorry. Big old mouthful of water. <laughs> um, no, that's, 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 I think that's like something that, people don't talk about necessarily enough is the everybody is so sometimes so focused on got to make it got to be the guy that's always there got to have this conversation with this person or you know I have to maximize my potential with this interaction or whatever it's like bro sometimes you just need to like chill out and be a cool dude and you know be genuinely yourself and be like 
have a conversation about what you do, but don't like, you know, don't go hard in on people and like, you know, destroy an interaction. That's a very easy way to destroy an interaction. Is I mean, like, I'm always seeing those posts where people are like, you know, how do I how, like, OK, so I just started a conversation with somebody, you know, how do I close them? <laughs> like like it's not car sales like if someone goes to a car dealership they want to buy a car if somebody hits you up and you're a producer they they might really just want to ask you about you know like how did you get into it or what kind of microphone is that in your profile picture or like you know like you don't have to like think about people as like money signs you know mm-hmm. or numbers numbers yeah, like if you if you give genuine feedback and have a like develop a relationship with that person, then your odds of getting hired in the future are a lot greater. But then on top of that, you also just made a friend, you know. Yeah, I, th- I think there's a lot to be said about that, and 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 it's really funny because, um, I think it's just the era we live in with like the the online guru that has all the answers to your to your prayers, and in, in my <laughs> eyes, um. What we what we have to look at, and this is a, this is a, just a reality of the industry, is that you know good work speaks volumes. Mm-hmm. If anybody asks me how to build your business, it's like uh, uh, no, I'll, actually, you know what? I'm just going to backtrack a little bit there. Sorry, guys. Um, <laughs> still on the same topic, but people who are saying I'm just starting out in mixing, uh, how do I get clients? I'm not sure if my folio is that good. You know, like where where people are sort of in that point where they're yeah. starting out. And I'm like, don't get clients. If your folio is not good, why are you trying to sell something? Go make your folio incredible. Mm-hmm. Go work on your product so you're the best mixer that you absolutely can be. And then come back to the drawing board to find clients. Not because I don't think you're deserving, but because if you want to succeed, you want to be at your absolute best, putting out your best work. Exactly. Um, and otherwise, you're just going to keep hitting your head against a wall. Like, nobody wants to work with me. Nobody wants to work with me. It's not you. It's that, you know, nobody wants to work with the mixes that are substandard they want the fucking best and right you know that's and i i was running into that um you know like this year was the first year that i was like i want to do pop music all the time like i don't want to really do heavy music anymore like i don't want to push it anymore and um so i was like the most i'm doing is like radio rock right and um you know I, i got a few clients you know, like from the start without much of a portfolio. But then I was like, man, I'm hitting a wall. I'm not getting any inquiries. Like this is like right after we moved back. Cause I think I officially like pulled all the metal stuff off of my website in like late July. And then we moved, uh, early September. Mm -hmm. And so it kind of like hit me one day. It's like, well, Josh, you're asking for clients to work with you and they have no clue what you're actually good at. And so I just hopped into this phase of just working with anybody, regardless of what their budget was, as long as I wanted to be a part of that project and felt like I could do a really good job at it. And uh, that's been working out for me fantastically. And so I kind of feel like I'm at this cool point where it's almost like, see how quickly you could like get a business going. Cause like I was doing okay in the metal world and then I got burned out. So um, it's nice going into it this time with like that, mindset but Mm -hmm. uh it's so great that you pulled that up because that's something that you know i'm kind of working through right now yeah and you shouldn't stop working through it man Mm -hmm. like even even when you're working and getting clients in like what's the next step how can you get how how can you do whatever you're doing but like keep pushing that benchmark higher and higher and higher like for me every week one day of a week i'm um doing like it's i i look at myself like kobe bryant not that i'm as tall as him but like in terms of like training myself up so it's like Mm -hmm. this week i think you might have seen i did reverbs so i just you know went through the weekend's catalog started trying to build out reverbs which matched his voice that was my oral training that was my ear training i've got a whole list of a bunch of plugins um for mastering which i haven't tried and again next week i'll go through another one try and push it to its limits understand what it's doing develop that side of it so you know like even for you like with your pop stuff like try try only work with one set of samples or only um like foley sounds or something like really try get that envelope and stretch it far forward um because you know 
it's it's easy to be comfortable. Um, oh yeah, it really is. But it's but it's fun when 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 you find something new. I recently found the Leap Wing, um, Leap Wing uh, Dyn One multi band mm-hmm. compressor, and it is like <laughs> it is. Yeah. I don't know where. I do you guys know the plugin at all or? No, mm-hmm. I don't know that one. Leap Wing. Okay. Leaping Dyne One D Y N O N E. Um, so basically, it's a multiband compressor. But what's super incredible about it is that you can parallel blend in the signal of each band independently from one another. Yo, this is crazy. I like this. Yeah, it is. Um, Yo, this so, is yeah, wild. When, when, when I when I when when I've got like a, a mix that comes in and there's like a lot of low level detail, you know, things really far in the background. But I don't want to use an EQ or over compressor to bring it out. Mm-hmm. I will use a parallel multi band compression. I'll use this plugin. I'll compress it relatively hard and then just blend in. It's mm-hmm. subtly in the background, so it's just bringing in those details just so subtly, and none of the transients get lost. You get a. F- it, it's. I. I was like, I. I was really excited about it when I saw it. I actually thanked the developer because they did a really good job at documenting the PDF, so you can read through it and understand it, mm-hmm. what it's doing, and that's the yeah. best so when you again, get a good manual. It's just, just one little thing that happened out of me having a big l- list of plugins to try, and mm-hmm. I, I. I rarely buy plugins, but um. I ended up purchasing this one after two trials of it. I was like, I just want to triple check. I hopefully I'm not getting trigger happy just because I'm <laughs> excited by all the bells and whistles. But no, that's it's, um, that's exactly how I am. I'm very like weird about buying plugins because mm-hmm. like you know I feel like when you're like first starting out, you like buy a bunch of stuff and then you don't use any of it, um, or you bought like the things that you end up preferring other things to. So you know I think as we all get older, we're like, do I really need that? And I did that with uh, um, Outputs Thermal recently. And it's like this crazy, it, it's like an EDM guy's like go-to saturation plugin because it's multi-band and it's super effect-based. But what I did is if you just run a, a, a high band starting at like 5K or just under 5K and you put it on the AM shaper and um, just give it a little bit of sauce on a vocal, It'll make it'll completely glue the high end of a vocal just perfectly in place, and then on the same band you can run a compressor to act as a deesser so it doesn't get too out of hand. And because uh, I really kind of sat down and I was like, well, I'm doing a lot of compression, like, and I end up with mixes that don't have a lot of transient. So obviously I'm doing something wrong. And so I really just kind of like listened to a vocal, and I was like, well, the reason why I'm using so much compression is because I want that high end to stay pinned. And I was like, well, I could probably do that with saturation. And so I was going through different plugins and found that. And that's been a game changer for me. It was one of those moments where like overnight you feel like you just improved so much because you just sat down and figured out how to use one plugin, you know? Yeah. This looks like a sick plugin. It looks like a... Um, the UI is wild, on... isn't it? <laughs> yeah. It looks like one of those... Remember those like, um, oh, like in the 90s... Um, at school, those Space Invader games, not like Space yeah. Invaders, but like where you'd have like the little um, thing that would shoot the bullets out and you'd fly yeah. around the screen. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Like that, a, gal- like that, a that's what, that's... Galaga or something like that. What What, what did you say there? You, you like cut out my... A Galaga or something like that? Like one of those kind of games? exactly, exactly like just, yeah, <laughs> yeah, pretty much. That's, that's what the, the graphics remind me of. Yeah. It's super cool, and like you have all these different options. I'm pretty sure that like Fab Filter Saturn is pretty similar, mm-hmm. um, but this one seems a little bit more extreme. So you can use it for mixing like that, but then you could also use it for more sound design oriented stuff. And it's kind of just yeah. like this perfect saturation plugin that does a ton of different things. Me and Josh have been on this on this spin we uh, of this idea of like compressing less in production and saturating more as a form of compression. Um, So like, yeah, kind of using multiband saturation instead of compression to achieve a more 
a cleaner and more uh, unique goal. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. It's been so working out pretty good a, so far. Give me like a really specific situation where you typically come, like, let, let's say a vocal then. Okay. Do you still compress your vocals or are you saturating yes. them? So I do both. And mm-hmm. so before I would run like you my pre EQ so I could get the highs to come out more. And then I would typically run either two or three compressors all doing a few dB of gain reduction. And so what I ended up switching to is running um, Ozone 9. So I'll do thermal and then that goes into Ozone 9 and then some form of a de in between or after depending on what it needs. But um, what I do with that is I will use a little bit of the tape saturation to kind of calm down more of the peaks. And then I use their spectral shaper to take out any gross frequencies in like two to three and a half K that get a little annoying and harsh. And um, that will actually basically just pin that area. So with the saturation, I pinned the air and then I'm pinning the second part with spectral shaper. And then after that, I'll use their dynamic section, just the regular dynamic one. And um, I like using that because you could put the attack all the way down and it doesn't click like at all. It's super, super transparent. So it's very fast and it's also just transparent. And I'll just only run like eight to nine dB a gain reduction, and it's been perfect. And uh, cool. after that, I'll actually just run it through a maximizer just for to kind of calm down some of the uh, some Oops. of the differences and yeah. the peaks and whatnot. And it's been it's been I've been great. doing it. I've I've been doing it on eight oh eights for like hip hop stuff. Um, so instead of compressing heavily. And have and not and pinning it with like either a limiter or compressor, you give it more life and it keeps more of the transient. Um, if you use a saturation and kind of kill some of it that way, and then use um, like a transient designer to reintroduce it, but in a controlled way. You guys are like crazy science freaks like this it's like i'm going in a willy wonka's factory and you you, sh- you show well, me a whole bunch of when you, shit uh, like, when you lack this I'll much be, like, natural I, I was talent because i was just curious like what your thought process was because like the, the way my thought pro- especially when it comes to mixing like I'm, I'm i'm a simpleton i'm no i'm no special to specialty mixing engineer um because i'm pr- pretty much doing mastering but when i do mix vocals i'm listening and what i do is like i, I just dial the volume down i listen through it and then i'm like how much is this jumping out at me and then I'm like, okay, cool, 76. And then based on what I'm hearing, that's how much I'll control it. Mm-hmm. And then I'm pretty cool. Like, and then I'll do a whole bunch of other like fun effects and shit in buses. But like, that's about as much as my dynamic processing brain goes in mixing. I just like pull the volume down. Is it popping out? Am I losing it? Mm-hmm. Yes. Well, no. also, mind you, we both learned how to mix in metal music where everything is over compressed with a ton of distortion, like after the fact. Yeah. So like having that thought process of sculpting a vocal doing some saturation to get it to that point and then lightly compressing it so it all just sits perfectly is like something that we're not used to because mm-hmm. before it was pin an 1176 pin decapitator and pray for the best you know and automate <laughs> to death yeah so that's how it's crazy that that was my former like that's yeah. I remember taking like a like a metal mixing class and that was they were literally like okay just run an eleven seventy six pin it and then take a decapitator <laughs> and pin it and that's it. We uh we we got the idea from this uh, mix engineer uh, John Castelli, so he mixed um dude like I didn't even know who this kid this dude was until I started listening to him talk on a bunch of podcasts and like his interviews and stuff. Um, he mixed the kid Leroy record that dropped last year. That's like been okay. blowing up. He's, he's a, just, a um, ton of big records. Aussie. Yeah, yeah. He's he Aussie. Is. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I pretty sure, pretty sure he's done work with a friend of mine here in Australia in that's Brunswick. Awesome. 99% sure. Nice. That's awesome. 
Yeah, that's like a 17 year old kid and he's great but like that's that was like one of my favorite vocal mixes ever mm -hmm. is uh specifically always do off that record and uh that kind of like then i heard him talk about that and i was like why am i not being more intentional about the tools that i use mm -hmm. and so like once i kind of figured that out and realized i was just doing things because like out of habit i realized i just had a ton of bad habits and i wasn't bad at mixing i just had bad habits i needed to figure out yeah he he it's really I was going to say the other thing he did was uh, he he had a really cool conversation where I figured out the 808 thing was he did a similar thing because he mixed uh, Khalid's Free Spirit record. And if you listen to that record, that record knocks, dude. The 808s and the kicks on that thing are freaking punchy, bro. They sound so good. Uh, but they're but they're like clean, but they hit really well on any listening device, like whether it's a phone good speaker system, car, radio, doesn't matter. It always hits. Um, it, so yeah, he just, you know, he mixed a couple things where I was like, yo, I really, there was something different about what he did. And I was like, I want to figure out like some of the stuff that he did. So we started kind of translating some of that stuff into our own productions. Nice. Yeah. No, it's interesting hearing everybody's sort of like arcs in terms of like, how they're navigating that 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 sort of developmental curve because it's 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 really it, it's really cool because I think we all experience it and, uh, and it's nice for me just hearing it from a separate perspective rather than being so internalized to it. It's like oh cool, this is this is what's going through these people's heads and how they're navigating developing their chops because um yeah for for me it's like and and it, it it's actually what's what's the way of saying this. I actually feel a little bit more human hearing your stories because it's like what I I've experienced everybody else is experiencing too. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, that's sort of like you look back and you're like, wow, cool. That's how I used to do stuff. I can't believe that, but I'm so grateful that I've like leveled up in a different way. And I'm at this point. Um, yeah, that's cool. Thanks yeah, for, dude. Thanks for t like letting us in on that, that full journey and, yeah, it was just nice for me, man. Yeah, I, I did. I'm sitting here listening, enjoying myself. I was, uh, <laughs> I'm I like was a podcast with... listener on the podcast episode. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, dude. You just no, reverse we're, engineered we're always this trying podcast. a bunch of stuff. <laughs> That's yeah, awesome. Like, how can I get one more? How can I get one more podcast listener? That's right. I'll get the guest to listen <laughs> in while we're doing the podcast. While we're talking. <laughs> <laughs> That's um, so good. No, yeah, we, we, we always try like a bunch of different like kinds of stuff. We're always like sharing a bunch of different ideas and like, uh, I'm always, uh, I'm always scouring the internet for like, this song sounded really cool. Like, um, I recently did a super deep dive into, uh, there's this dude from my state called Jetson made and he's been doing, he's a hip hop producer. He's been doing, uh. He did that Jack Harlow song, What's Poppin'. He did that uh, that cool. baby song, Suge. And uh, I don't know. He's got like a really interesting, like minimalistic hip hop style. So I've been doing like a lot of deep stuff. And he's he does it in FL Studio. So everything of his is like very, very gridded and very, very simple. And I was like, there's something beautiful about like for me as a producer it's like i get into the mindset of ah it needs more it needs more and he's like all these layers and like i need to like set like have so much and there's something amazing about like those kinds of songs where i mean what's popping is literally just that piano sample of uh, a dope well designed drum beat and an 808 and that is literally the whole song that is it and like there's something amazing about like getting that to translate. Yeah. I, I think it's even like quality over quantity because there are some songs and like, I think you guys coming from the heavy world can appreciate this where there's like six or seven really well arranged guitar parts, like really good. All right. So it's good quality. The record sounds awesome. Then there are some <laughs> records where there's six, horrible guitar parts <laughs> where the arrangement and the voicings you're wondering what the fuck am i listening to <laughs> um so i i think i think it's like one of those things where it's not just like whether it's stripped back or too much it's like mm -hmm. the pedigree of what's going on in the intention is is really important and that translates 
so much through to mastering because mastering is like uh, when you get a mix and you're working on a master, at least at least when I'm working on a master and you're going through and you're listening to every detail, you listen to the whole thing, it's like looking at the music naked, especially mm-hmm. in a mastering room or a control set because you hear every little detail, every bit of saturation that just distorted the kick too much or <laughs> every little bit and and it's like you re- like the the songs that do so well at the end of a mastering session are the ones where people were really intentional about how they put the production together, the composition, the arrangement, the mix, as opposed to people who just threw shit at a wall and they were like seven guitar parts five different kick layers, mm-hmm. four different snare samples that all phase together. It's like, <laughs> you know, and then, then it comes, then, then you do the master and you're like, oh my God, how am I going to manage this? And you've got like 17 different multiband compressors and a parallel processor and you're using, fuck, uh, who, who knows? Like you just, you end up having to create three different channels so you can fit in the 30 different plugins to correct everything. And you got low end completely disappearing from like can't phase cancellation between the kicks and the bass and like, or the kick just disappearing for some reason because the samples like misaligns for some reason. <laughs> and all yeah, you hear is like, like this little the, tick. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's all about intention. And yeah, I, I think, I think, you know, having those three parts, that piano 808, beat it works because they work really well no. like yeah i just did a production session for an artist and they're a heavy band and they're like like they had like a standard song structure but like everything was so like different like there was a lot of contrast between sessions like one of their verses might have three different drastically different parts to it and they were like we need you to add a bunch of stuff into this so it sounds more like a song and I was like, okay, fair enough. And it was the hardest project I've ever done. And so, you know, it took me a couple days just to like send them the first version of it. And, um, you know, so I sent it to them and I was like, you know, this is kind of bare bones. I really like wish I could add in more stuff, but I don't want to ruin what you guys did with it. But I also just want to like enhance it just enough. And, um, they liked it. They all their only complaint is that there wasn't enough bass drops in it. So <laughs> added in the bass drops, sent it over to the engineer, and uh, just today, I guess he unpacked the session. He was like, "Dude, you're a genius with what you did." And I was like, "How am I a genius?" Because I felt like I didn't do a good job on it. I felt like I should have put more stuff into it, but I couldn't figure it out. And he was like, "No, like the simplistic approach was exactly what the song needed." And I, I felt so good that like for the first time ever, I didn't like typically whenever you're confused, you start just like layering stuff in hopes that something works out. But I didn't do it this time because <laughs> I didn't want it to, to make it obvious that that's what I was doing. And it turns out that I just did enough to get the job done. And uh, I think that that's that's like something that most people just miss is that they aren't super intentional about what they're doing. And, you know, like the kick drum sample you use matters like that happened on a session I did two weeks ago. Um, we were going through a mix revision over Lander in real time. And he was like, yeah, like, you know, the kick knocks, but it also kind of doesn't. And the 808 kind of knocks, but it also kind of doesn't. And everything just kind of feels bloated. And I was like, all right, hold up. So I pulled out 160 hertz out of the 808 and I highlighted every single kick drum and then I chopped it in half. And the short decay and the fact that I pulled out 160 in the 808 completely changed how the entire song felt. And like, he was like, okay, we're done. That's perfect now. And it's like, because I didn't put the thought into how long the kick drum was, you know, like when you Mm -hmm. think about those things, you, you can really knock out something first pass if you really care about everything that you're doing. Mm -hmm. Oh, geez. And actually, I was actually curious. Did you see my post on, automating kick tails no i did not oh man it's like it's it's like you just took a, a complete leaflet out of my book um <laughs> oh i I, I did a, i did a post because th- this is the thing and uh, so people aren't just listening on and being like what the fuck is this crazy aussie talking about um <laughs> like lots of kick samples that come in are already compressed the fuck out of they're mm-hmm. 
usually like stripped from a production or just out of things and projects that a producer's used, they're put into a pack, it's went out onto the internet. So a lot of that compression, the release time, the attack time is working for a completely different track. Mm-hmm. And I'll just get this. If, if you go on my Instagram, you, you'll be able to stalk me and <laughs> see all the cool records I've done, but then also see this post I've done. Um, and basically it's just got me... It's it's got the waveform and you can actually see the waveform and how it's compressed and bloating on the tail. And then I did three different versions where I've automated the tail with just volume automation. And you get three completely different tones out of the kick. But this way, like when I was mixing, before I was like jumping to EQ and compression and sidechain and all this sort of shit, I just created a few different automation curves and then copied them over a few bars each and then just figured out which one felt good in the in in the chorus for this song um and it's like the cheap tricks way of doing it but it works i don't even say that's a cheap tricks way that's like the intelligent way to do it because then you're that's the long road you're saving the long road (laughs) yeah you're saving yourself time you're doing it the right way technically at the most basic sense you're getting it right at the source of as close as you can you know so yeah i mean i think that's the intelligent way to do it instead of having to go through and compress and eq or side chain things or auto like you know gate things or write in weird like write it just yeah could shorten it sometimes you just need to shorten your kick tails because it's too long yeah and a lot of people can't hear them or in their monitoring system either that's something i've noticed as a mastering engineer things come in and they can never hear like the the compression releasing in the subs of the mm. kick Works so like, you'll always hear this like, like opening I a little always bit. get this wallop at the end like there's always a wallop and it's not my it's not my my room my room's really tight down to like 30 hertz and when i get a tight mix i hear it but when i get a loose mix i hear this like boom, 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 boom. yeah and i'm like what the? i'm like i'm like guys um you might want to use like a, a low sh- like the the thing the thing that gets a bit funny with low frequencies and kick drums especially when i'm sending notes is that even the most minor of changes to the kick drum can change the whole composition of the mix so i've got to be really careful so it's not like just 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 cut it just just use a high pass mm-hmm. just no you can't do that because that introduces a whole new bunch of problems so i'm usually like use a six decibel octave curve start at a 10 hertz and let that tail off into it or use a shelf that's mm-hmm. you know just one or two db really not Reduce, too steep yeah. just soft um because some of that wallop, some of that shit tone is, is also what they've been hearing and enjoying because it does sometimes give a bit of energy, a bit of character, mm-hmm. even though it might sound really crap when it's poking out. But um, yeah, yeah, that's, that's one thing. My, my thing would be, if you, if you want to check your, your low end, just get a system with big subs and blast yep. the fuck out of it and you can quickly hear <laughs> yep. what's out. Like, that was my it's biggest issue. It's the right issue. way to mix. It's just, it's just a fun <laughs> way to figure out yeah. when, when stuff is going shit. Yeah, like I um I was I was working off of a set of Dyn Audio OID sevens and like they're pretty solid. Like they have a tight low end, but it kind of falls off earlier than I would prefer. And the mid range is very detailed, and the high end is very good on those speakers. But everything that I did, I would go take it into the car, and my low end would sound bloated, and then my high end was always like ear piercing. And so I finally pulled the trigger on a set of Focal shaped twins, which aren't anything crazy, but. I knew I wanted like a two and a half way speaker for that clearer low end because I've missed it for so long. Literally the first mix I did on these, it was a night and day difference. I, For the first time ever, I heard how much transient detail I was not hearing in the low end. And I was also hearing how it was hitting my master compressor. And that was like a huge moment for me where it's like, why didn't I just do this two years ago? You know, like my life would have been so like, like I would be such a better mixer if I was just able to hear what I was doing. I thought I was bad at mixing. I'm not bad at mixing. You just can't. Well, you're bad at mixing when you can't hear what you're doing. Exactly. <laughs> like, like I, oh, I first mix I did, it was like the best sounding mix I've ever done. And I was like, oh, my goodness. For the first time I took it out to my car and I was like, oh, this competes. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. It, it reminded me of a super funny story. And. I'm going to say this because we're over an hour in and very few people will hear this. And if they do, oh, oh, it'll be funny for them and they can enjoy it. (laughs) So I'm 13. I'm like Googling, you know, audio stuff, how to create great mixes. One one blog says you need to have great monitors. I'm like, 
what the fuck are monitors? Everybody's talking about monitors for getting clearer mixes, this, that, the other. I didn't realize they're talking about speakers. So I start Googling <laughs> monitor plugins, like as in like the monitor is an actual like device or something separate to the fucking speaker. <laughs> Um, oh. Yeah, that's that's that, that, that that's fifty. That's fifteen years ago. We were years ago, we were just talking about this in our group chat today. Me and Moshe were going back and forth about like the early days, and I remember like I had my Pod HD five hundred like hooked into my computer as an audio interface, and I remember being like, I need drums, and I know that people program drums, and so I was googling like free uh, drum machines that are plugins. I didn't know that sample libraries exist. I didn't know about contact. <laughs> I had no clue. I didn't know that superior drummer or whatever was big back then existed. I was just like looking for drum machines and then I would like download it and like give my computer a major virus. And then I was like, man, why do these sound like, like house drums? Like, why is it like a 707 kit? <laughs> and not metal kits. <laughs> <laughs> and so I think about that a lot and it's like, you know, I've kind of come a long way in like the seven years or however long it's been since I was Googling that. <laughs> it's, it's so funny, the shit that like, especially like coming up and, and not knowing is, is, I don't know, it's just fun to look back and have a little bit of a giggle and a laugh. It's like, yeah. oh, fuck, that's hilarious. Um, <laughs> oh, dude. What, what, a. Uh... Like, uh, so you were talking about like that low that kick tail thing was like a really good uh, you know thing for mix engineers to focus on. What would you say is an another couple of like things that mix engineers miss a lot as a mastering engineer? Oh. I. L- I don't think any of them, or not any of them. That's a stupid thing to say, but like I think there's very few mixing engineers who blast the fuck out of their speakers to really hear how something plays out loud. I I, I remember, um, when I went to, when I was in LA last year, I was in, I was at Howie Weinberg studio. Mm -hmm. Okay. This guy masters records all day, like a motorhead concert. (laughs) It is like, there's no soft. It is like that fucking loud for six hours of the day. Like it's, it's, fucked but <laughs> what it did teach me is that if you can get something that's really pleasing when it's that loud it's gonna also sound pretty good when it's soft and what i've noticed you know is now when then when i got back to australia when i was mastering records i don't know i just fucking crank the speakers clients get scared the <laughs> shit out of but like i just like blast the fuck out of the speakers as loud as fucking possible you know i've got good headroom so they're not distorting but the first yeah. thing that goes when I'm doing that, either two things, either you, you really do start to hear where the deficiencies are in the low end and how tight it is, but really, th- th- and that's, that's an issue that can be an issue, but more importantly is harsh vocals. Harsh vocals yeah. make a mix impossible to listen to when you crank it. Like you just, or, you need to turn it down because it's painful. So that's something or mixing the, engineers uh, should do. I've noticed, or the opposite, your vocals disappear totally. Like when you crank it and they're not like balanced right, like either they're way too harsh, like what you're talking about, and you're like, oh no, I can't listen to that. Or you crank it and then it's, they're gone. (laughs) Or yeah, yeah, like something else is harsh. Cause I've done that where I want to turn up a song because I can't hear the vocal very well, but I can't because like the drums or whatever else is in the song is like really, really hard to listen to. Yeah. So it's like, Crank the shit out of the speakers. Does it sound good? Yes, no. Play it really softly. Does it sound good? Yes, no. I know. I just think it's a different way of. I, I don't. I'm no ear scientist to understand the psychoacoustics of it. Um, but all I know is that hey, if it's gonna hurt my ears in a mastering studio, it's probably gonna hurt other people's ears when they got iPod headphones on. Mm, right. So you know, it, it's 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 something that that mixing engineers should really be conscious of because typically what happens is I find people doing like a lot of weird processing effects on the vocal where they've got multiple parallel buses and things. And then what happens is on these loud notes, all the phase indiscrepancies come out and it creates like resonancy peaks at like two, three, four K, you get some comb filtering. Um, And then those resonances, I end up having either use something like soothe or pro Q three to notch out. 
um, but then it ends up affecting the whole mix. So typically, it'd be really good if mixing engineers could just crank the shit out of their speakers, blow their ears up, um, <laughs> and you know make sure it's sounding good when it's when it's loud. Um, but I'm accepting no liability or responsibility for any blown <laughs> eardrums from that advice. <laughs> Or noise complaints. Or noise complaints in, in small places. Oh, that's good. No, that's a, that's that's a really good one. That's actually something that I've started to do recently. Uh, just randomly, I was I was like, oh yeah, I just really need to hear what this is gonna sound like if I'm just like jamming. I mean, dude, that's like part of why we enjoy doing what we do. We like loud stuff. We like to jam. So like, yeah. why not sometimes just like turn hit the song on if it rocks? Like especially like if you're producing or songwriting a song, like it's got a bump, dude. You know, you got to crank it. Yeah. It's got to hit right. You got to be able to bob to it. You got to be able to groove to it. The one thing I will say about that is that if you have cheaper speakers, yeah. maybe that's not the best option well, yeah. because the amount of high end smearing that you're going to get is going to make you think that your top end is silky smooth. <laughs> Shout out to JBL LSR 308s because I thought I was the <laughs> king of high end whenever I first started out. But really, it was just smearing so much and distorting so much that I thought that my top end was very smooth. But in reality, it was super harsh. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> That's this, interesting. This is all assuming that you have the setup to actually do this. Yeah, yeah. So if you have yeah. good speakers, you could do that. <laughs> oh man, now, uh, how we had like um P- big massive towering PMCs like two hundred grand worth of speakers, like fucking yeah. blasting this. So it was like, <laughs> yeah, it, it, it give was, it to it me. Was like it, it was fucked. It was it was really cool. I don't get that sort <laughs> yeah. of monitoring level out of mine, but I crank them loud. What it's, what, it's, what it's are you for using for your monitors? Uh, the Neumann KH three ten A's. Ooh, I don't see a lot of Neumann yeah. guys, mate. Once you like, I I shot these out with ATCs, um, which like double, triple the price, and these ones, one out. Like these ones, at least in my ears, one out. They were just really the transient response in the low end was subliminal, like, like. You you hear you, it's almost like you can visually see the sound wave moving through the air when it hits in the low end. It's just it's super tight, um, which is why I like them. They're, they're, you would not want to produce on these. Yeah, they're boring as fuck though. Like <laughs> <laughs> they're not inspiring at all. But for mastering, when I'm like, yeah, shit's on the line, and I'm gonna make sure things are pretty tight and going out into the world sounding as good as they can. These are good speakers for it. Yeah, I'm I'm thinking about going to the the PMCs, the result sixes. Yeah. Yeah, nice. I'm thinking about going to the result sixes. Uh, just I don't have any. I just have HS sevens right now because that's what I can afford. But they work. You know, I'm used to them mainly. That's why I grew up on like around them. So like whenever I was first starting out. So like I know them well, which is unfortunate. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nah, yeah, that that's a pretty expensive speaker to know well. I'll, I'll tell you a super unfortunate story, a real unfortunate story. Okay. So you know Key Audio? Yeah. Okay. So when they were first coming out of the woodworks at the Melbourne Audio Trade Show, they had a display. Like this was unknown company, yeah? Like this would have been maybe in their first 18, 24 months of putting out products into Australia. So... I hear the speakers and I'm like, these are fucking incredible. Like they're ridiculously good sounding speakers. And at the time they're about 14,000 Australian dollars, which is probably around the 10 grand US mark when they first came out. Um, and I'm like, I don't want to drop the money because they're a new company. I don't know how long they're going to be around. You know, you know, all these questions. Cause you don't want to drop like 10, 4, 10, 10k us and then the company goes bankrupt and you're stuck with speakers you can't yeah like service or move or use fast forward now if i want to get them in australia they're 30 grand Boo. Boo. <laughs> <laughs> i know i, I was I, I, every every time i see that i'm like like 
I, I think I made the right decision. It was a responsible decision not to get them. But if I could go back in time, I would have been like, just get them, just just do it because they yeah. are they're really they're really incredible sounding speakers, and it's something you don't see very often is um, new companies coming around and having a flagship line that actually sticks around. Usually, it pops mm-hmm. up stays for a couple of years. They might reinvent it with a new line, sell it off to somebody else. But yeah, they, they, their, their speakers are fucking good and they stood the test. They, they stuck around and now every day I see yeah. them or I just kick myself. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> that's tough. That's oh so man, funny. it was tough. Yeah. Keys are crazy. Whenever, uh, so I went with a buddy to Vintage King in in Nashville. Uh, he ended up buying. He was looking for. I don't remember what he was looking for, um, but he 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 ended up buying uh, some barefoots. Uh, yep. And he was. I think he was. He was either looking at Focals barefoots, and he had something else that he was looking for. Uh, but he ended up going with the barefoots, but we went to the other room and got to see like the high end, high, high end PMCs and the eight, the high, high end ATCs and the keys and like all that kind of stuff. We got to bump some stuff through them cause they have like a listening room, uh, where you can like yep. check all the speakers. And I was like, man, I just, there's, I want it so bad, but it's just so expensive and there's a room involved. Like, it's not even just the speakers because the speakers are crazy expensive, but then like having a room to justify having that. And a lot of those are like, you got to be able like to handle, I mean, you want to get correct power for that. You want to make sure that like your, your D to A is like super so clean for those kind of things and vice and a to d and to when you're tracking all that too so that it makes sense but it was just like it just listening through stuff i heard like my especially my mixes at that point i listened to a couple of my mixes on it and i was like ah, i hate myself never never coming back here to do this again <laughs> yeah no they're, they're just they're just a really special speaker and um yeah, no, nah, just it's just a sad story, man. It's, it, I, I kick myself every time. I'm like, that's so funny. You're uh, this close, yeah, this close. This, yeah, but you know what? You, you say you, we we all say that, but how shit would it have been? Yeah. to drop like that sort of money and then them not be around anymore. You're not able to get like a woofer just... if it breaks, you know? Yeah, like, yeah, no, yeah. I'm not, not about it that. It was not worth the risk. So mm. I'm I'm happy with my decision. Yeah, but. Still some sadness there. It's sort of like, oh. <laughs> no, yeah. that's good. You said it was the KH120? Is that what it is? Th- no, 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 no. Sorry, the Neumann, which ones? What are we talking about? Oh, the 310As. The 310As. Got you. Yeah. Yeah, those are nice speakers. Yeah. Dim, yeah, Dim's nice. I haven't even thought about They're, looking um, at the Neumann line of stuff. I might end up... I might look at those. I've heard nothing but great they, they, things from Mix guys. Like... You know, they're revealing in all the right ways from my understanding. Yeah. And they've got no ports, which is really cool. So they're completely yeah. sealed. Hmm, which that's is awesome. what contributes to that low end being so tight because they're not relying on any like port resonance to in yeah, what's it called? What's the word for it? Um to like sort of impose any super uh, not supernatural, superficial uh low end. Yeah. Into it low end into it it's it's all sealed so it's super super tight what you're hearing um hmm. but the only thing that like i if if i was a producer and i had clients in the room i would not have these speakers i'd probably have something like um the sm9s by Focal. like i love sm9s really. so much i love those Sorry? speakers i i love oh, sm9s yeah. the studio that i'll like go track at downtown he has sm9s and i remember the first time i listened to those and i heard bass instead of feeling it i was like oh these are cool <laughs> and uh yeah. i love the tweeters on them i just think that they're great that's part of the reason why i got um my shape twins is because i was going to get a nicer pair of speakers and go with like um go with pmc and then i was like why would I want something revealing if I'm mostly producing? Like I want something that's fun, but still accurate. Vibe. Even and, the KRKs. Uh, like I know a lot mm-hmm. of people like hang shit on the, on the rockets, but there's a reason why so many people have them in their studios because they're 
fun to listen to. And if yeah. you're getting bored and depressed when you're trying to produce and create, it's not going to be conducive to good records. I'd rather have mm -hmm. like, and this is, this is nothing like before I'm talking about, you know, really good mixes, really intentional stuff coming in for mastering, producing the best masters. And there's a caveat to that. Mm -hmm. A really good song produces the best masters. And if you've got the tools to help you do that, that's super important. So like, yeah, you, they might not be the best sounding speakers, but yeah, they get people excited in the room. They get everybody yeah. popping, thinking yeah. about the groove, yeah. connecting with it. Exactly. And that's kind of the happy medium. They're accurate enough that I feel comfortable mixing and they're fun enough that I like to produce on them. And I feel like that it's hard to find a speaker like that, you know? Um, I remember the first time that I tried mixing on SM9s, I was like, wow, this is hard. <laughs> Just because it was so much different than what I was used to. And uh, yeah, those speakers are fun. They sound yeah. so good. <laughs> they're, they're almost like the, the, those speakers I, I would um, like sort of put on the same level as your first experience going into a car with subwoofers. Like that excitement in the sound when yeah. you're like sitting in the seat. It's yeah. Like, oh, wow, what the fuck's going yeah. on here? Yeah, I remember I turned <laughs> um, them up and I was like, oh, this is cool. And then when I went to Clear Track over in Clearwater, they have these giant Dyn Audio main systems. And I remember the first time that I went there and Lane turned up the volume and I was like, oh, so this is what it feels like. Like it's that same feeling that you get when you first hear yeah. like music in a new way, you know? Yeah. Um, the the Tannoy Gold dual concentrics, those speaker cones, mm -hmm. um, going old school, but like where I used to assist, he had them so fit mounted into his studio. And it's just one big speaker, but it sounded awesome. The sound stage was incredible. I, I, I was like, really like, what the fuck's going on here? They're, they're not meant to be doing that. But <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, there, there, there's there's so many there's so many cool speaker designs, and I think we're really we're spoilt for choice in this day and age. Where mm. even if you're dropping like eight hundred bucks, you're gonna get a pair of speakers that are pretty accurate. Whereas if you go back yeah. twenty years ago, there are some pretty weird, wacky, dodgy yeah. designs which hit the markets, or you had to spend a lot of money. So yeah, we're lucky now, man. We can we can get some good speakers cheap, and there's there's yeah. lots of variety out there for people. Yeah, me yeah. and me and me and Josh were talking about it. The I mean, you can you can drop really like the sweet spot is like between three and four grand as a mixing it from a mixing engineer point of view or like a producer yeah. point of view. Like you can drop somewhere in that area for a pair and come out with something really good that. You're going to be yeah. able to hear the detail and you're not going to have, you're going to have plenty of headroom. You're going to be able to mix well. And yeah, you're not years ago, to you drop couldn't do that. $30,000 on keys. <laughs> yeah. No, no. I think everybody's spoiled for choice in that, mm -hmm. in that respect. Um, and you know, there's some really cool designs, like even the, like the smaller barefoot ones are really incredible. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't know. I just, just lots, lots of hats off to, to people putting those products out because, um, you know, it's becoming very different, the landscape we're working in. You know, people aren't necessarily fitting out studios with big Dyn Audio mains or Osberger speakers mm -hmm. or whatnot. They're, 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 they're like, hey, you know, I'm moving from one apartment to the next and, you know, I need to save my space and be able to work on the move and, mm -hmm. you know, headphones suck, according to me, but... So I need I need good <laughs> pair of speakers as, as well. well. It's, it's, it's funny, the headphone thing. Everybody <laughs> raved about the Odysseys. I got them and they sounded good, but I could never work on them. Mm. They look really heavy. And I've heard people say that they're really heavy. And that bugs me out. These are like ultra light. Um, yeah, mine these are, are too. Audio Technica R70s. I these things are terrible for mixing, but they're super comfortable for like day to day use. So I'm glad I have them. But like, it's just one of those things where it's not a good time. It is just, <laughs> it's just a bad time all around. I would much yeah. rather have speakers. Yeah. But it's like, I don't, like, if I want to hear the music, I want to hear it, like, fucking put hairs on the end of my arms, yeah. not just, like, go into my ears, and it's like, yeah, cool. This is like, it, it, it's like the doctor when he's, like, you're going for a checkup, and they're looking in your ear with with the, the, the light thing. It's like, it's, it's just, what the fuck, bro? Um, yeah. You know, same it. with the headphones. It's just, like, sitting on your ears, and you're like, yeah, cool, cool sound, bro, but I, <laughs> I, I want, I want to hear, I want the bass to fucking, you know tell me what I ate for dinner last night when it rumbles in my stomach. Like I, I really want something that's fucking, you know, I can engage. So that, that's why I just don't yeah. get headphones. That's why I like the, these headphones, I don't know where the, f f 
what the fuck they are. They're, they're like just some cheap piece of shit I had in my cupboard. And I'm like, I need headphones for this interview. Um, <laughs> I didn't want you guys to get feedback on it, but like, yeah, yeah. Anti, anti-headphones, man. That's so funny. I'm definitely on board with you, man. Coming from the conversation with Mick Lucas that we just had, which is like he's trying he's trying to teach himself to mix on headphones so and produce remotely on headphones so that he can travel. Yeah. And it's like he's he's a madman. He is. He's a madman. He's an awesome guy. Yeah. (laughs) But there's something about headphones, man. It's like (laughs) Nah. calling you out calling you out john <laughs> there's so much there's so much love there for him because he, he's the most bubbliest personality he's like uh, he, he's he's literally like a mcdonald's ad in a person he's just like got all this goodwill and ronald mcdonald love and yet and yet he wants to mix on headphones so i, I don't know maybe he's going down like the burger king route <laughs> I, I just uh, you, you, you have yeah. to understand he is such an awesome dude but yeah. then you put throw headphones into it, <laughs> mate. Immediate, oh, immediate, immediate. Like... It's like what he has those. Doesn't he have like really nice vocals as well in his yeah. studio? Yeah, he's got some cool. I think he's got the solo. Does he have the solos? No, he has Amphions. No, oh, oh yeah, 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 yeah. He upgraded yeah. to Amphions. Okay. He has yeah. the one eighteens. Because do you, do you know do you know like when you say um, monitoring and John's name, you know what I'm thinking of? You know when he's got like wait, where's my phone actually? You know when he's like he's like this on his on his Instagram he's like, "Hey guys, I'm just bumping this," and he's like fucking jamming out, yeah. it's bumping out of the speakers. We're gonna miss out on that if he has headphones. <laughs> That's the thing. I spent How one selfish. week. How selfish! I couldn't make TikToks for a week. I didn't know what to do with myself. <laughs> oh yeah, I didn't even think about that. Yeah, I, I couldn't forgot. make TikToks. We talked about that. Yeah, you couldn't even like. Bump. What do you mean? What- he couldn't even like make TikToks of like him producing stuff or like trying a different technique or anything like that. Because yeah, I was no trying to, to like do um, I was trying to do a sound design Sunday. That was going to be my one day a week on TikTok that I would post, and then just to make a healthy habit of like interacting online. And I did like two of them, and then I realized I can't do this while I'm on headphones because <laughs> I can't show people what I'm working on. <laughs> So, speaker gang. That's all right. Yeah, That's and maybe right. he won't do I, it. I just maybe he won't do it. Maybe he'll maybe he'll upgrade his speakers. I know he sold his Amphions, or he's working on selling his Amphions. Yeah. But uh, maybe he will. Maybe he won't do it. <laughs> yeah, Man, it's it's so funny shooting this shit like this. <laughs> yeah, I feel like we could really sit here and talk all night. Probably. Um, hey, uh, we can we can close it out. Let's close it out on this. Give us Nick Nicholas Di Lorenzo. Give us three records that you're like these records masters are just like the sickest thing I've ever heard. Okay, cool. All right, I'm I'm not going to actually talk about the, the the sickest masters. Okay. The reason being is because like they're not like I, i'm gonna go the funnest record okay the that's, that's fine where, yeah yeah, yeah. that's like, that's I'm actually like, the question fuck. i wanted to ask okay yeah. and drew so was let's like let's that. make it about let's mastering <laughs> let's go that route wait, wait, three wait. of the funnest records the funnest record all right um alifung by black eyed peas Ooh, golly man you remember yes i that's, do <laughs> you that that is that is fucking gold 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 gosh dude um throwing me back <laughs> uh rakim the master okay so i don't know that one. Oh, bro i wish i could play it and then you guys could hear it but <laughs> it's just gonna go straight through to my sh- my headphones how do you and, how do you, how do you, you know, spell you know, it how do you spell it how do you uh r-a-k-i-m Space the master. I'm gonna like this record so I can listen to it tomorrow. Okay, so uh, the album is called the. Okay, the album's called the master. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I got it. Okay, and then I'm about to have some because I actually just put together a playlist of of my road of my road trip songs. So I'm just (laughs) going through them and finding the albums I like on here. Heck yeah. Um, Hey, you don't have to stop at three. 
You don't have to stop at three. You can go do more. <laughs> Actually, you know what? Uh, okay, you know, I don't mean to throw myself a bone here, but um, the Crybaby EP Laddie Moran put out, which was mastered by yours truly, um, is so fucking good. So much props to him on that record. I, I really enjoyed it. That's Laddie, L-A-D-D-I-E space Moran, and the, L- the EP is called Crybaby, one word, Crybaby. Yeah, I'm definitely gonna have to check that out. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, saving these. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know. I just, I just get a bit funny when it's like talking about favorite masters because it's, yeah, I, I don't. You, you know what the problem with this is, and and I know we're closing out, but I, yeah, I think yeah, it's yeah. really important people hear this. No, for sure. Is it's it's really important when you're listening to music, you're listening to the music. Mm-hmm. And it's not for me to sit here and judge, oh, I would have made this more harder or more more louder or more wider or, oh, mm-hmm. that's so cool because it does this. It's like, well, wait a second. What you're hearing isn't just what the mastering engineer did or isn't just what the mixing engineer did. It's a combination of everybody's sort of decision making. Mm-hmm. And that's the music itself. So either you resonate with the music or you don't. And you can't pin it on one person because I, I think the problem with like, especially when it gets to audio file levels is there's a lot of elitism on mm-hmm. it. Like when it comes to, and, and, and I don't like to be a part of it. So I gave you guys three records that I just listen to and I enjoy. And that's, that to me is really important about music. And yeah, um, I'm, yeah. I'm, yeah, I'm about to go bump these cause I haven't listened to the black eyed peas in a hot minute. <laughs> So it's been so Wait, you've long. Heard the al- you've heard the album. Yeah, 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 yeah. I've heard it. It's just been a minute. <laughs> yeah. And let me just see if they released on Spotify. Yes, they released the original on Spotify, which is good. Because they, they did a whole bunch of radio edit re-releases because some of the language and stuff in it. Uh, but no, they you. released the um they released the, the, the original original on Spotify, which is good. Oh yeah. No, they, I, so I'm on Apple Music because I get it for free. But yeah, I'm about, I got it. So I'm about to I'm about to jam this junk, dude. I'm about to go in on this. That's awesome, man. You're gonna feel like you're back in the early thousands, dude. Yeah, it's 2004 all over again, man. It's 2004 all over again. <laughs> Lovely, awesome. All right, guys, I'm gonna yeah. let you get back to your evenings. Go get some rest. Yeah, you, um, you got to get to work, yeah, man. I'll let you, wait, wait, how <laughs> horrible am I? This isn't even my podcast to be closing out. <laughs> guys, I'm going to let you no, guys you're do good. it. You know, you know you're, your outro sequence. You, I'll, I'll let you guys roll. No. Uh, well, you mentioned it earlier. You're just committing to the bit, so I yeah. respect it. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah. Uh, Nick, thank you so much for coming and hanging out with us today, man. I'm thankful for Josh for uh, getting you to come and hang. I, I didn't oh, do anything. He hit me up. This is his yeah. podcast. I, I hit him up. Oh, yeah. He was like, hey, can I hop now? on your podcast? And I said, <laughs> duh. Well, thanks so much for hitting Josh up then about coming on, dude. That's so that's so sick. Thanks for coming and hanging. We're going to have to have you on again no. to talk about the mid 2000s pop music. <laughs> <laughs> no worries guys <laughs> all right you enjoy yourselves get your rest and um let me know when this is yeah. up and i'll share it around and i know you'll pick a cheeky snippet out of it as well for oh, instagram guaranteed. probably where i'm hanging shit on john definitely who knows guaranteed <laughs> <laughs> all right uh drop your uh instagram handle where people can follow you um if they aren't yeah, definitely finding you on uh the podcast Oh, okay. Yeah, no, I had to Google my own Instagram handle because I always forget it. Um, it's panorama underscore mastering. All right. Give them a follow. Thanks so much for hanging out. And Josh, thanks so much for coming and having another chat with me. Always, dude. That's why I'm here. Dude, always. <laughs> and uh, thank you, everybody, for coming in and listening. Um, keep on creating. You See you guys later. And that's it for this episode of the Home Studio Hangout Podcast. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, Please check us out on your favorite podcasting platform. Leave a review. It helps the show so much. Kind of get out there for new people to find. Uh, If you want to watch this, if you aren't already, 
Uh, check us out on YouTube by searching Home Studio Hangout. Uh, and thank you so much again for giving us your time and your attention. And remember, keep on creating. <laughs>